Agile FM, radio for the Agile community. Thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Agile FM. This is the Agile Kata series, and today uh, we're going to explore Kata from a leadership's perspective. And I have here with me Mark Rosenthal, who is with Novayama. That is his uh, company. He's out of the uh, West Coast, United States. And we can all explore a little bit together leadership in conjunction with Kata, which is this entire series all about. So we're going to explore that angle a little bit. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much. It's looking forward to the opportunity. Yeah, this is awesome. I want to go back in time with you and talk a little bit about an employment you had where you work from home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't get a lot of phone calls until you got one. And yeah. that was the one you got terminated. Yeah. But the interesting thing is you, in your reflection, you had a let's say a moment of realizing a lack of leadership skills. Yes. And yeah. And really that was, and this is even better because this is really the kind of leadership that most Kata practitioners have to engage in, which is influence. You don't have formal authority. You rather, you've got to yeah, you have to find a way to influence the lead, the line leaders in the organization to be effective. Mm -hmm. And this is true for lots of cases. It's true whenever I'm bringing groups of people together that I can't tell what to do. And actually, it's more true than you think even in the military, which is where I learn leadership. And it really was that we tend to do, we practitioners tend to engage with the technical artifacts and we put in the tools, we put in the mechanics and we don't, and then we complain when the line leadership doesn't embrace the changes. And that is on us because if you look at a traditional Kaizen event approach, for example, in the world of, you know, of CI, but this would be equally true for somebody trying to get Scrum in place or somebody trying to cause any change in the way the organization does business. I can describe the mechanics of the daily stand-up perfectly. I can describe, I can get all the scheduling, I can get the artifacts into place. Mm -hmm. If there isn't a engagement of the conversation about how we do it, on a daily basis to then it's going to fall apart as soon as that 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 goes away in the situation you're describing i mean it was even worse in a way just because of the nature it was an international organization and it didn't really matter where i worked so i didn't work anywhere although i got a lot of frequent flyer miles you know mm -hmm. going to europe once a month going all kinds of places but what I was doing was making technical recommendations. And then, you know, they weren't getting picked up in, frankly, I wasn't earning my money. Yeah. And the key here for a change agent is it's not about the tools you're putting into place. The tools are there to create the kinds of conversations that need to happen in the organization between the leaders. And between people, between groups of people. And once I understood that, then the paradigm changes completely because the experiments I run are testing whether or not I'm effective at moving the needle mm -hmm. about how these conversations are taking place. And that's kind of what I was talking about in the, you know, yeah. in the story that you're alluding to. Yeah. So this is a life-changing event for you but also in your career, right? You had a lot of learnings coming out of this. A lot of them, and they came later on. Mm -hmm. you know, I had, I was familiar with Toyota Kata at the time, but I was still in the position of trying to make people do it. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. What I have to do is look at the dynamics in the organization mm -hmm. and think in terms of, it's not the mechanics of standing up a storyboard, and getting them to go through the starter kata of grasping the current condition and all of that. It's about what 
actions, what small experiment can I run mm -hmm. that I think that I hypothesize will nudge the conversation into, for example, talking about something a little more concrete than we had a good day or a bad day, which moves them toward measuring how they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that example, that particular organization really had disdain for numbers mm -hmm. because they made people look bad. So they didn't talk about them. I mean, they had them on displays, but nobody ever talked about them. And the numbers they had on displays were lagging indicators. Yeah. It's interesting because you said like the words, if I remember sure. correctly, you know, like you said, like moving the needle. And I think that's also important from a leadership's perspective, or we just in the operations mode of tools and yeah. features and yeah. keeping those alive, or are we disrupting certain ways of working within the organization yeah. as a leader? Yeah. And you're going to be disrupting. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole point in a way. So when I want to begin to shift things, what I want to do is engage in the smallest change I can that's going to move things. And I'm going to try to do is to incorporate that change into something they're already doing. Mm -hmm. So in this example, there was already a daily production meeting. So rather than saying, we're going to have another meeting about improvement, rather than saying, you've got to stop doing that way and start doing it this way, I can hook part of my agenda into the existing structure. Mm -hmm. So as a change agent, I want to look at what are they already doing and can I grab any of that and just modify it in a way mm -hmm. that moves the conversation in the direction it needs to go. Yeah. This is interesting, right? There's two things I would like to talk about, and I'm not sure which one should be first or not. I'll just take one and get started. Maybe it's the wrong order, but we just went through a, or just like two years ago, we yeah. somewhat ended the, the, the pandemic and we started going back to work and your experience, obviously from work from home was prior to, to the pandemic. Now. You had some learnings in terms of leadership, and we see a lot of companies that are bringing their people back to work, mm -hmm. sometimes mandatory, and sometimes it's the leadership team that just feels like very strongly about that. So I want to just include that in terms of it's yeah. very present right now. There's a lot of companies still work in that kind of dual mode or mm -hmm. came back full time back on the premises. What advice do you have based on your learning? for leaders when you work this way? I don't know if you have any, but I'll just put you on the spot. You know, that's a good one. You know, you're going to encounter resistance, but, you know, this is a quote from Ron Heifetz out of Harvard who talks about this thing called adaptive leadership, which really is applying PDCA to leadership. And that's why I like it so much because it follows the kata pattern of grasp the current condition, make a, you know, make a judgment where you want to go next and run experiments to try to get there. And he said, and I love this, people don't resist change. Mm -hmm. People resist loss. Nobody gives back a winning lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. And so the people who are, are used to working with the cat on their lap and having, be able to respond to their kids and all the awesome things that come from the ability mm -hmm. to work from home are losing that connection that they have developed with their family. So that's what they're resisting, typically. You know, I and you can't speak for everybody, but what's, you know, the flip side is what's the boss, what did the company lose when the people didn't come to the office? And that was the informal interaction that drives the actual conversation that gets stuff done. Yeah. And so that's what I didn't have, right? Yeah. You know, we didn't have... I don't even think we didn't have video. We didn't, you know, I mean, this was a while ago. Oh, you know, I think, yeah. You know, Skype was cutting edge stuff, right? Hard to imagine, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 You know, if I were to go back to the same situation, I would be having a lot more scheduled online sessions with not just individuals, but with groups of people sharing their experiences with, in my case, with continuous improvement, 
mm -hmm. and what they're doing so that I didn't need to be there all the time. But I could work on keeping the conversation and the buzz going and get a better read for the organization. Yeah. You mentioned that I've heard you say things like that leadership is a uh, typical leadership happen. Yeah. Word is authority. And that sometimes you do see that when you go back to, to work in, you know, in work environments where you're being asked and forced to come back to work versus adaptive leaderships taking a, a different approach to something like that. But another quote you said, and maybe that's the other angle I wanted to ask yeah. you is, I heard you say a phrase that leadership is an activity, not a yeah. role. And that's, again, I want to make credit where credit is due. That's right out of, you know. Ron Heifus, it's work, and a lot of it is taught at a place called the Kansas Leadership Center in Wichita. And so I want to make sure I'm giving credit where credit is due. But, yeah. So in, there are, you know, there are cases where authority is a good thing. There are cases where you have to get something done fast. The building is on fire, we evacuate immediately, not, hey, what do you think we should do? But even when there is formal authority, it's far more effective to use leadership as a role with the goal of developing other leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, if you know, are familiar with the work of David Marquet and his book, Turn the Ship Around on the Submarine. You know, he, as the captain of the submarine, had absolute authority. Yep. And what, and I read that book, I'm a former military officer, I was in the Army, Okay, we, we didn't get in, I did not go on a boat that was designed to sink. But at the end of the story, he tells a story of he interprets a situation incorrectly and he gives an order that was incorrect at the end of the story. And he is countermanded on the bridge with no captain, you're wrong, from the lowest ranking sailor on the bridge who countermanded an order from the captain of the ship. Yeah. And all it did was cause him to look back, reassess, and realize that this 22-year-old kid was right. And that's what we want, right? We yeah. want people to tell us if we're making a mistake. Yeah, that's a key lesson. I remember this. I listened, I listened to that particular book, which is also very eye-opening. Now, seeing a leadership, like this, we see adaptive leadership, but it's obviously something you are embracing. There's a lot of books out there about leadership. That's a massive amount of books and people could go wild, but you know, many of those are personal stories about what that person has embraced. And you might find something very useful here and there in certain uh, areas of those books, but yes. you might not 100% apply to your own situation yeah. and yeah. Where that might leave the reader with how would I approach this problem with all that wisdom that is out there? And how do you combine? And this is where I want to go with you, you know, in terms of leadership is how can the agile cutter, the, the cutter, the improvement cutter, coaching mm -hmm. cutter, how can the cutter ways of working, scientific thinking help support leaders who are like, I want to create an environment like that. I want to have adaptive leadership. How can cutter help me with this? Great point. Because, you know, all those books are those, as you pointed out, those people's personal stories. And it's interesting because all the, all of the stories about success have survivor bias built in. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, they're in, in, in lean world, there's a, a commonly bandied about number that 85, 90% of all attempts to put it into place fail. We read about the ones that are successful, but what we don't know is that the ones that failed probably followed the same formula and it only works five or 10% of the time. That's really the story here. Mm -hmm. So what you, there isn't a cookbook and what you got to do is first understand the culture you're trying to build. Because if you don't have that in your mind deliberately, you're going to end up going wherever. But then you've got to grasp your own situation in your own organization and then set that next target condition using kata terms mm -hmm. of, okay, 
I'm not going to try to get there all at once, but what's the one major thing I'm going to try to get in if I'm trying to change the change away an organization runs probably on a 90 day window. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're in industry, Akata, we set a target condition of a couple of weeks and no more than that. But, you know, these are bigger things. So where do I want to be at the end of the quarter? Where do I want to be, you know, in three months? And then that narrows my focus. And then I can just start working on that. And maybe it's just, I'm going to, inc- I'm going to get the staff meeting working more effectively so that we're not trying to solve problems in the meeting. We're just talking about the status of problem solving. That's just a hypothetical example, but that was one place I try to take people, for example. Yeah. Then I'll just work on that. Mm-hmm. So you work with leaders through coaching cycles. You, yeah. you, uh, yeah. you coach them yeah. going through the, the four steps of the improvement cutter. Mm-hmm. Um, and you help them to, as you say, move the needle to what's more adaptive leadership. And this is using adaptive leadership really to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's a meta thing in a way. And when I'm, you know, I'm really talking to the change agents out there, you know, the, and out in, in the agile world, you know, the scrum master is mm-hmm. a staff person who's the holder of the torch of what this is supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. So this is what they can do uh, to work, you know, to say, okay, I know it's not perfect right now. Mm-hmm. What is the one thing I'm going to emphasize over the next 90 days to get it better? And maybe yeah. it's, you know, I'm just going to get the stand up to be less than 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I just got to get people to just, you know, this is what they talk about. And then they pass the torch to the next person or, example, mm-hmm. or the next pair in that case. You are, I think, by looking through your material a little bit and, and seeing where you're coming from, you're using a tremendous amount of powerful questions. Can you, again, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, no problem. But can you give possibly some, like a, like an outline of how, what kind of questions you would be throwing? So, so to make it a little bit more concrete. We were listening to this, like a leader or somebody who's like uh, receiving some form of coaching from you and then what kind of questions it's powerful stuff. So the coaching kata, just to some background here on what Toyota kata is, just so that we got on topic is what Mike Rother essentially did. And this isn't a hundred percent accurate, but this is the effect is he parsed a lot of the coaching conversations that were happening you know, with leaders and learners at Toyota. And those conversations often are around A3, for example, which is just a piece of paper. And often it just sounds like a conversation, but there were elements of the questioning that was that were always present. And the way I describe it is he boiled all that down. It was left at the bottom of the pot was the mm-hmm. structure of questions that he published as the improvement kata. So I'm going to ask first, I'm going to go off the script first. What is your target condition? Mm -hmm. So I want to hear is where you're trying to go in the short term and what will be in place when you get there. Mm -hmm. What is the actual condition now? And between the two, I'm really looking for is what's the gap you're trying to close between where things are now and where you're trying to go in that short term. Then we're going to reflect on the last step you took because you committed to take that step the last time we talked. Mm -hmm. So what did you plan as your last step? What did you expect? Because there was a hypothesis that if I do this, then I'll learn that or this will happen. And what actually happened and what did you learn? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to ask, okay, what obstacles are now do you think are now preventing you from reaching your target condition? And so really that's, Mike chose the word obstacle because the word problem in the West is really loaded. Yeah. Okay. Because a problem to a lot of people in industry is something I don't want the boss to find out. Yeah. You know, another company I work for, I called them barriers. That was before Kata was written. But if I go back and look at my stuff, it's basically the same structure. 
And I, that's just an enumeration of what mm -hmm. the person, the problem solver, the learner thinks are the problems. And th as a coach, that's kind of telling me what they think right mm -hmm. there, right? I'm beginning to see what they see because they're telling me which one are we addressing now? It's important to address one problem at a time. Yeah. And then based on that and in being informed by the last step you took, what are you planning as your next step and what do you expect? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the script. Going off script often just means asking calibrated follow-on questions to get the information that I did get from the primary question. This is where, you know, if you're talking to Tilo Schwartz, he's got a lot of structure around that, right. um, which yeah. is really a contribution to the community. Yeah. But your questions are not yes, no answers or status. Oh, no. Related. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. That's no. Well, even the follow-ups are um, yeah. investigative, kind of like yeah. bringing things to surface for the learner, not for you to receive a status. When... What I'm looking for is, again, Toyota Kata jargon, their threshold of knowledge, the point at which Okay, the next step is, and there are times when, you know, even before we get to all the questions, if we encounter that threshold of knowledge, okay, great, we need to learn that. What's the next step in order to learn more about that? Mark, this is, so this is really good. I was just like listening to Katie Anderson's book, and this was funny that you say problem in the Western world, not a very popular word. And she makes tons of references in her book about no problem is a problem, yeah, right? That's, yeah, um, that's the Toyota so mantra. That's yeah. the Toyota mantra. And yeah, so whatever you want to call it, you want to overcome it. If it's an obstacle, an impediment, or if it's a problem you want to overcome. And that's a really good point about the culture. And I'm going to quote my friend, Rich Sheridan here, you know, fear does not make problems go away. Fear drives problems into hiding. Yeah. And we encounter that a lot where I, I go into a culture where everybody has to have the answers mm -hmm. or everything needs to look good. And so asking them, what problems are you trying to solve here can be problematic. And so that's where the adaptive leadership part comes in. Okay, I'm going to have to overcome the obstacle of that cultural hesitancy and find a way to help them get a shared sense of the truth that they can talk to rather than talking to each other. Yeah. And if, again, if I go into, you know, the, like the extreme programming world where I've got the cards on the wall, for example, mm -hmm. that is that shared sense of the truth. I can walk in and I can tell which pairs are working on which things and whether they're ahead or behind. Mm -hmm. very quickly without having to ask anyone and there's nothing concealed it's fully transparent mm -hmm. we go into industry the purpose of the visual controls the purpose of the status boards the purpose of the end on lights the purpose of all of the lean tools mm -hmm. all of them is to put the truth of what's actually happening out there as compared to what should be happening so that we have an invitation to yeah. deal with it yeah but they're tools but they're, but that's all the tools are, that's what they're for. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Mark, I want to thank you for uh, spending some time here talking from a leadership's perspective to the Agile FM audience and uh, sure. in particular in the Kata series to explore Kata and how Kata can influence uh, leadership and what you can do to embrace adaptive leadership while performing scientific thinking as a leader and obviously your personal stories as well. So thank yeah. you, Mark. Sure thing. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.